We Unhappy Few. This is from Endnotes, and this is the second part um, and last part. Three, case studies analyzed. The cases of the praxis group and the theory group with which we began this text concerned examples where the conversation in small groups broke down and trying to make sense of them the theory of the conversation offered by Gunn, which both these groups were aware of and referred to, seemed insufficient to deal with the crises the groups faced or to understand how they were resolved. To make sense of experiences like those cited in the, cases, in the case studies, we have turned to psychoanalysis, group relations, and in particular to the work of Wilfred Bayen. Here we found some texts that seemed to speak uncannily to us and to the experiences related in our case studies. In the internal establishment, Paul Hoggett, using a case study of a community project he was asked to consult with, gives an account of certain dynamics of, um, of group life that are similar to the case of the Praxis group and the experiences that many people have when they start to question aspects of political groups with which they are involved. Hoggett draws on psychoanalytic ideas from a number of sources, but especially Wilfred Bayan's idea of an establishment within the group, through which to understand what he identifies as a deep structure in collectivities that allow certain forms of thinking in life to exist, but which ruthlessly acts against others. Borrowing Christopher Bolus's term, the unthought known, Hoggett suggests that groups like individuals have aspects which, while known in some sense, cannot really be thought about. For to do so would threaten the group's illusions about itself. For Hoggett, the fact that groups tell partially illusory stories about themselves is not a problem in itself. It is part of the creative quality of all social life. Groups, as Hoggett puts it, occupy that potential space where nothing is simply real, nor simply hallucinated. Their creative capacity exists in a space they make for themselves through their self-narrative. But as he warns, the step between illusion and delusion is short indeed. The imaginative fiction has the propensity to become a consolatory myth, constantly reinforced by propaganda. The story the group presents to others is as much about misleading itself as misleading others. Questioning this story is often experienced as persecutory and shaming and produces a reaction from what he calls the group's establishment, a pathological organization within the group which guards its unthought known against exa examination and critique and responds by patching over gaps in its illusions. Summing up the idea, Hoggett suggests the establishment is a reactionary and secretive force, a hidden deep structure which operates more like a network than an institution, that while capable of acting with violence and terror, it normally relies on guile, propaganda, and patronage, adeptly drawing upon individuals' as worst qualities, their desire not to think too much not to ask too many questions. Hoggett suggests that the split between a restrictive establishment and the rebel within a group pushing new thinking is not one of good and bad individuals, but something that exists within individuals themselves. The conflict of which Hoggett speaks is between two universal tendencies in groups and individuals, one towards development or learning from experience, the other towards resisting such learning. As he put it, in a group, every member, in differing proportions, is both a victim, a tyrant, a rebel, and a collaborator, that is, part of the establishment and part of the opposition. The function of the establishment is to police this racket. Hoggett's typology suggests that individuals criticizing groups from outside can be as much a victim of restricted thinking and as conformist to a group in the mind as the members of more obvious groups in the world that they subject to criticism. Moreover, Hoggett's interpretation can be easily extended from formal groups and institutions to the informal milieus and networks that people now tend to operate in.
and even loose identifications like the left, anarchism, Marxism, the ultra-left, or the movement, which may have their own unthought, knowns, their own establishment, their own injunctions against thinking certain thoughts, and their own pathological ways of dealing with dissent. Drawing on Hoggett, we might say that what happens in the Praxis group, or what happened in the Praxis group, was a failure of the group and its establishment to deal with change and development that the new ideas represented. The new ideas challenged the group's unthought known regarding the relation of theory and practice and the role of radicals and revolutionary theory. The focus on the new ideas was seen to get in the way of the group's practical orientation, its existing conception of its purpose. The new ideas were seen as a threat and action was taken to eliminate their disruptive presence. The theory group formed with an explicit aim of being open to new ideas and ultimately to reality itself. It was influenced by the same ideas that tore apart the praxis group. One danger it faced was that the new ideas that were so explosive to the framework of the praxis group would become their own restrictive framework that functions as an establishment. However, the tensions that almost tore the new group apart in its early years were of a different character, related as a shadow to the very positive feelings its open creativity generated. Interestingly, just as we found in Hoggett's Inner Establishment, a description that uncannily matches aspects of the Praxis group, in his Partisans in an Uncertain World, Hoggett offers a way of thinking about what he calls the creative or revolutionary work group that resonates strongly with the case of the theory group. Hoggett recounts an experience of forming a group with politically like-minded academic colleagues. He describes the excitement, free-flowing creativity, and sense of possibility of the group. Spontaneously bound together by the shared, <coughs> by the shared desire and imagination of its members, the group does not require any formal discipline. Noting Bayan's um, concept of cooperation applied to the work group, Hoggett suggests that, as apt as it may be, it hardly does justice to the electric-like nature of the group he is describing, which can be better thought of as a free association in which the free development of each is the condition of the free development of all. Similar to Gunn's account of the conversation, Hoggett finds a model for this peculiar kind of willed group in the accounts given of crowds and other collectives that form in relation to revolutionary events. He draws on a description of such collectives by Poland, who in turn is drawing on Sartre, who states that they can draw an, on an almost electric field of common assumptions and shared norms, allowing them to carry out their tasks and pursue their goals with a speed, efficiency, willingness, and comradeship that makes formal structures and procedures practically redundant. People who have seen barricades thrown up, whether in Paris in 1968 or Gezi Park in 2013, or participated in lower key events of social contestation, will recognize what is being talked about here. Yet Hoggett claims that such a process can also apply to a more willed small group. Hoggett's description of the character of his small group and its mutual supportive common purpose as exciting and electric-like resonates with many people's experiences of the initial period of a political group or project, whether it be a reading group, publishing venture, or a more immediately struggle-oriented collectivity. What he describes as the problems that such groups encounter also, unfortunately, resonate. He noted that, almost immediately, we were each aware of the possibility of betrayal. This was not about defection, of joining the other side, for at that moment there were no sides to be drawn. Rather, it was a fear of one's fellows not giving of themselves. The creative or revolutionary group demands one thing, the generosity of its members. What is feared then is not defection, but the failure to give generously. For the group, this is the one form of dissent which is difficult to tolerate. In the theory group, the tension that Hoggett describes seemed to be at work in the conflict around the member who wished to go abroad. It came up at other times around fears that someone might use ideas developed in a collective context to advance a personal academic career. For Hoggett, this possibility that one's comrades may differ in their commitment arouses both psychotic and depressive anxieties, both the fantasy of the disintegration of the group and the fantasy of its, of its disfigurement.
One might add that what one sees and finds unbearable in the other may also represent a part of oneself that one disavows. The anger and hatred directed at the comrade who is seen to betray or sell out is a way of expelling a part of oneself that might like to act in this way. And it is the way that the other stands in for such parts of oneself that accounts for the passion of the hatred. As Hoggett suggests, such anxieties, potentially unbearable feelings of mistrust, betrayal, disappointment, and disillusionment are unavoidable. The best that can be achieved is their containment. This means that the creation of some sort of establishment whose function in part is such containment is inevitable, and the task becomes to create an establishment which has more the quality of being benign and less the quality of being destructive. He suggests that the way to minimize the need for this establishment and to make the one that inevitably is created more benign is to create a culture or a way of being in the group, which is generous and tolerant. That which in every day language is referred to through phrases such as it takes all sorts and live and let live. This is difficult because the greater the intensity of one's own commitment, the more it cries out to be requited. However, as he argues, if the group demands the generosity of its members, then it must adopt a generous attitude in return. The power of such analyses as Hoggett offers seem self-evident to us. Their illuminating power derives from a combination of Marxian and psychoanalytic perspectives. These insights have also led us to turn to psychoanalysis and in particular the work of Wilfred Bayan, which underpins Hoggett's work. Four a theory of groups, a theory of think and a theory of thinking. The differences between a true thought and a lie consists in the fact that a thinker is logically necessary for the lie, but not for the true thought. Nobody, nobody need think the true thought. It awaits the advent of the thinker who achieves significance through the true thought. The lie and the thinker are inseparable. The thinker is of no consequence to the truth, but the truth is logically necessary to the thinker. His significance depends on whether or not he will entertain the thought, but the thought remains unaltered. In contrast, the lie gains existence by virtue of the epistemologically prior existence of the liar. The only thoughts to which a thinker is absolutely essential are lies. Descartes' tacit assumption that thoughts presuppose a thinker is valid only for the lie. Um, that was a quotation from Wilfred Bayan. Wilfred Bayan, possibly the most cited author in psychoanalytic literature after Freud, is a somewhat extraordinary figure in the history of psychoanalysis. He revolutionized the understanding of groups through a psychoanalytically informed theory, and then transformed psychoanalysis itself through his theory of thinking, through his theory of thinking. We find both these theories of relevance to what we are and what we do. Before exploring these theories, it is worth saying something about the social context and individual that produced them. Bayan was born in 1897 in India into an upper middle class Anglo-Indian family. His father was a civil engineer directing the construction of railways and irrigation canals. The nature of his father's work meant that the young Bayan absorbed more Indian culture than most colonialist children. A key figure in his upbringing was his Indian nanny, or Aya, who may have been the source of a certain Eastern philosophical feel to some of his later ideas. In a form of abuse, the English upper classes due to their children, he was sent to boarding school in England at the age of eight. He never saw India or his beloved Aya again. He was then further traumatized by his experience as a tank commander in World War I. While others saw him as behaving heroically, with both France and Britain awarding him medals, he described himself as having died on the road to Amiens. After the war, he studied history before becoming a doctor psychiatrist and then a psychotherapist at the Tavistock Clinic. In this capacity, he was a therapist to Samuel Beckett for two years, prompting much later speculation on their, in on their influence on each other. Dissatisfied with the eclectic form of therapy he had received and been taught, 
In 1938, he started a training analysis with John Rickman. With the start of World War II, they broke this off to work together as army psychiatrists. Bayan and Rickman became part of the Tavistock Invisible College in the army. This was a time of widespread sympathies with socialism among the British intelligentsia, and the Tavistock group was no exception. Experimentation with possibilities of groups was the order of the day. They were strongly influenced by Kurt Lewin's field theory. Rickman was also an important conduit for the idea of leaderless groups. During World War I, while Bayan had joined the army and played the role of war hero, Rickman, a Quaker, had been a conscientious objector and gone to Russia as an ambulance driver and relief worker. In 1918, he witnessed the revolution in the countryside, observing the Peasant Village Council, or MER, at work. Rickman noted, the village formed a leaderless group, and the bond which held the members together was that they shared a common ideal. Bayan was instrumental in developing a new way of selecting officers. The method he pioneered involved putting candidates together in a leaderless group and observing how leadership spontaneously emerged when a group was set tasks. Later in the war, Bayan and Rickman created what is recognized as one of the first therapeutic communities at the Northfield Military Psychiatric Hospital. This involved giving the patients autonomy to form their own groups to aid their rehabilitation. The Army High Command were disturbed by the experiment and closed it down after six weeks, but it blazed a trail for others to continue such work. After the war and on the basis of his wartime reputation, the Tavistock Clinic asked Bayan to pioneer the use of groups for therapeutic purposes. The patients and staff composing the groups expected him to lead as an expert. To their frustration, Bayan's approach was instead to encourage the participants to examine the tensions within the group, including the wish for him to take charge. Bayan theorized his experiences in a series of papers later collected as experiences in groups. While Bayan himself did not pursue this work, these ideas became foundational for a method of research and experiential training and development in groups known as the Tavistock or group relations approach. A theory of groups. Bayan's key idea was that all groups operate simultaneously in two ways, displaying two different mentalities. On the one hand, every group is what Bayan calls a work group. This is what the group consciously thinks it is about. It also refers to the mentality, attitude, and actions that reflect this purpose. The connection of the members in a work group is one of cooperation, where members draw on and develop their skills, capacities, and maturity out of a shared sense of purpose. For Bayan, the work group is, in however embryonic a form, scientific, because in pursuing their activity, whatever it is, its members probe reality seek knowledge, learn from experience, and thus change and develop. However, groups do not always operate in such a transparent, rational, and straightforward way. Groups often also display a mentality and activity that operates on a less conscious level that pulls in a different direction, puzzling and often obstructive to the group's conscious aim. Bayan found that this mentality and activity coheres and makes sense once we start to see the group as assuming it meets for something more primitive or basic than its consciously imagined purpose. He termed this aspect the basic assumption group. Bayan identified three such basic assumptions which he linked with primitive emotional drives, dependency, fight or flight, and pairing. These group states each give rise to a different kind of leadership which may or may not correspond with any acknowledged or unacknowledged leadership of the work group activity. Under the dependency basic assumption, the group acts as if it meets to receive everything it needs, wisdom, knowledge, guidance, etc. from one member. Under the fight or flight basic assumption, the group acts as if its purpose is to fight or escape from a perceived enemy. The threat may be external or internal, clearly or poorly defined. Close to panic, the group is particularly hostile to thinking, but will follow anyone who seems to offer an immediate way of dealing with the threat, whether this is by attacking or running away from the enemy. In the pairing basic assumption, the group orients itself patiently to the interaction of two people, or perhaps two sub subgroups. There is a mood of hopeful anticipation, a sense that the group will be saved, with the underlying assumption being that 
through the pair of the group is going to give birth to something great, perhaps a new idea or a new way to do things. An essential point for buy-in is that the work group and basic assumption group do not apply to separate groups, but to forms of activity present in every group and every participant simultaneously, with sometimes one and sometimes the other aspect dominating. If the work group aspect is dominant, the group gets on with its task. If the basic assumption aspect is dominant, the group behaves defensively. Groups can be seen to be influenced by a certain basic assumption for a long time. At other times, a rapid oscillation between the different basic assumptions can be observed. Basic assumptions may at times have negligible effect on or even be compatible with work group activity. But at other times, the basic assumption group interferes with or substitutes itself for the work activity. At times when stress circulates through the group, this mentality may come for extended periods to dominate the group in ways that can be compared to psychosis. How might such, idea, such ideas apply to the political or revolutionary group? As, as was alluded to in the introduction, one of the problems with the idea of a work group orientated to revolution or communism is that this is clearly not a practical object for willed groups in the present. Thus, the idea suggested in Bayan's group theory of keeping it on task is particularly difficult for a willed group when the tasks it orientates to communism or revolution will actually not be its product, but rather a product of spontaneous, i.e. determined group processes at a class and societal level. Bayan suggested that the idea that a group acts consistently in the manner of the work group is an idealized construct or even a group fantasy. This seems particularly true of groups nominally committed to the idea of revolution or communism. We all know that other stuff goes on in such groups. Whether it is routinized activity that no one really believes in, competition with other groups, or internal dramas and intrigues, there is much that goes on that has little to do with making progress in terms of what participants imagine to be their work group function. Observing basic assumption behavior in such groups is not hard. There is the common enough dependency phenomenon of a group having an often unacknowledged leading member or guru who the others consistently look to for guidance, even if at the same time this may involve, regular, may involve regularly being disappointed by what is delivered. Fight or flight behavior can be seen in the hostile and competitive relations such groups often have with each other and in the internal splits they are prone to. One might also see an affinity with the pairing, basic assumption, when a group is dominated by a messianic hope. The notion of a fundamental assumption that the group must be preserved also seems apparent and glossed as the necessity for political organization or for the party. Political groups also seem particularly prone to times when strange, often disturbing and unpleasant things happen between individuals in factions and sometimes throughout the group, persisting sometimes to the point of the demise of the project, more often to the point of a split or expulsion. But we should not limit our recognition of these behaviors to formalized political groups. All kinds of networks, scenes, and milieus that people operate in can display such behaviors as well. Analyzing what is going on in a group is not just a matter of applying basic assumptions. It is possible, for example, to see basic assumptions at play in the two case studies with which we began. However, the analysis we borrowed from Hoggett in the previous section indicates that any specific group difficulty will require not just identifying basic assumptions, but imaginative exploration of what precisely is going on in any given case. A seemingly simple lesson from Bayan's work is that when operating in groups, we can attempt to bring into focus both the work aspect of the group, its aim or purpose, and the less conscious aspects of what is happening that interfere with this. Alongside its work group activity, the group may make, to use Bayan's phrase, the study of its tensions a group task. Are the energies of the group focused on its agreed task or are they being dissipated in something else? This may involve not suppressing the processes that are interfering, but exploring them. At times, and such times are inevitable, when the work group is no longer dominant, collective awareness can be brought to it. 
This may, however, be difficult and require courage from its participants. Those who ask the group to examine itself often become the target of group hostility. Bayan argued that when strange things are happening in a group, everyone is affected, and the best one can do is retain a, a capacity to think under fire. Bayan is often taken as having a largely negative view on groups. This is because the approach he took to leading groups brought out the strange and disturbing things that can occur within them by producing stress and anxiety in participants. Bayonian groups bring into prominence the unconscious and defense basic assumption aspects of group functioning. Bayan's point was that we all carry these capacities with us. Groups, just as they allow us to achieve possibilities we can't attain on our own, can also bring out some of our less appealing, even psychotic qualities. He thought, however, that in the long run, despite the influence of the basic assumptions, the work group was triumphant. Indeed, far from upholding the individual against the irrationality of the group, there is in buy-in an insistence that groupness is fundamental to the individual, as he puts it. As the, to the individual, as he puts it, <laughs> the individual is and always has been a member of a group, even if his membership consists in behaving in such a way that reality is given to an idea that he does not belong to a group at all. The individual is a group animal at war, both with the group and with those aspects of his personality that constitute his groupishness. Drawing on this, Wolfenstein argues powerfully that the whole idea of the individual as a self-conceived outside of society and essentially constituted from the inside out is a group fantasy. Difficult experiences with groups may encourage taking refuge in this defensive fantasy, but it is a delusion. The scientific character that Bayan attributes gen generically to the work group aspect of any group takes on particular significance for a group oriented to theorizing the communist overcoming of capitalism. In this case, thinking, developing insight and understanding is fundamental to what we are about, at least it is what we like to think we are about. Though not entirely separate from any engagement we may have in struggles, it is thinking, understanding, and theorizing experience that offers itself to us as a task worth pursuing. At the same time, such a task is not a straightforward one. The object of inquiry, capitalist society, is not something that stands over and against the inquirer, inquirer but is rather a dynamic process of the composition and decomposition of social relations through crisis and struggle that includes the inquirer within it. Capitalism is not out there. It traverses us. It is us. As Wolfenstein puts it, in both psychoanalysis and the theory of social revolution, we are the problem we are trying to solve. To be aware of what is going on is painful. Outside of struggles, there are no easy benchmarks to judge if one's work group activity is having results, nor does such inquiry make one's life easy. Indeed, it is perhaps the difficulties of this task which involves going against all the obviousness of bourgeois society that give rise to some of the pseudo-answers and pathologies that particularly afflict such groups. It is relatively easy to identify how basic assumptions may interfere with the group orientated to revolutionary change, but what in the absence of revolution might its work consist in? If we are going to say that we have a task of trying to think then it is worth examining the second period of Bayan's work, which has informed our understanding, his theory of thinking. Towards the theory of thinking, the Kleinian development. While others enthusiastically took up the ideas on groups that Bayan had developed, he was not particularly satisfied with them. Finishing a training analysis with Melanie Klein, he went on from the early 1950s to practice individual psychoanalysis, and in particular to work with psychotic patients. It was out of this work that his most significant contribution to psychoanalysis would emerge, the theory of thinking. Bayan's theory of thinking only makes sense in relation to the Kleinian development in psychoanalysis and its key concepts of projective identification in the paranoid schizoid and depressive positions. For this reason, and because we find such concepts are independently of value, to understanding ourselves in the world, it is worth outlining them here. Drawing on an earlier discussion of mania and depression by Carl Abraham and Freud and her own pioneering work with children, 
Klein postulated an affinity between early infantile states of mind and those encountered in psychosis. She described two fundamental ways of relating to the world, which she termed the paranoid schizoid and depressive positions, and the movement between them as the key task of development. Klein thus displaced the Freudian focus on the Oedipal drama around the fifth year by a concern for more primitive levels of mental functioning, which emerge sequentially in the infant's first year, but which she thought continue to play a role throughout life. Klein contended that the infant in its first few months has the dominating anxiety of being annihilated and defends itself against this by a process of projective identification. Projective identification is an unconscious fantasy of taking things in and spitting things out, which feels real and has real effects on the developing ego. This involves a splitting of its experience into that of either wholly good and or wholly bad objects. The infant coheres its first sense of self through identification with and love for its interjected good object, which it needs to keep separate from its bad feelings of hatred and destructiveness, which it puts into the bad object. The prototypical good object is the gratifying mother or good breast. The bad is the non-gratifying mother or bad breast. Klein thought the absence of the object of the real breast was too much for the youngest infant and that in its fantasy, it instead experiences the non-breast as a concrete bad breast, which it tries to get rid of or evacuate through what she called projective identification. In a recurrent struggle to lessen its dominant anxiety, a cycle of splitting, projection, and introjection ensues. The projective identification of the paranoid schizoid position is thus what one does to one's difficult experience when one is unable to think about it, if not excessive, this projective identification fulfills a developmental function, allowing an eventual shift to the depressive position. The depressive position involves a more realistic and integrated picture of the world, in which the ambivalence of one's objects and one's feelings towards them begins to be tolerable. The infant recognizes that the good and bad perceptions of the material or of the maternal object which it has previously kept rigidly apart, refer to a whole object, an other person. If it thus recognizes that the bad, absent breast, which it has intensely hated, is actually the same object as the good breast, which it has loved. As a result, the main form of anxiety shifts from fear of one's own imminent annihilation to concern for this object, the person upon which the individual depends and which it is not able to control through mechanisms of projective identification as it previously fantas fantasized it could. The dawning awareness of the reality of self and others and of the impact of one's actions on those others is painful and subject to retreat back towards the paranoid schizoid position. Importantly for Klein, transition between these positions, though occurring for the first time around the middle of the first year, is not to be understood as a once and for all achievement, but as a continuously active process. The paranoid schizoid position is not so much a stage that is left behind, but more a distinct way of apprehending reality and organizing experience, which continues to play a role throughout a person's life. The attainment of the depressive position then is neither smooth nor certain. It continues throughout childhood and indeed can be considered a lifelong de developmental task. The understanding of the positions as two fundamental modes of organizing and processing experience, different ways of relating to the world, each generating its own quality of being, means that whether or not one is persuaded by the Kleinian speculation about the psychic world of the infant, it is possible to accept the positions on other grounds, namely one's own observation of oneself and others. Splitting of good and bad, an idealization of the good objects and denigration of the bad objects in which thoughts and oneself seem to be unintegrated or disintegrating. This is the paranoid schizoid position. Recognition of the ambivalence of self, of others, and of the situation in which one's thoughts and perceptions are more integrated expresses the realism of the, of the depressive position. If the depressive position is hopefully where we more normally operate from, we all will have encountered the paranoid schizoid state in ourselves, in others, and especially in collective life. 
we are all capable of moving into the paranoid schizoid state of mind, especially if put under enough stress. The psychotic part of our personality exists alongside the non-psychotic part, and thus the shift into the paranoid schizoid position is more sideways, sideways than a backwards movement. If Freud showed us we are all neurotic, Klein showed us we are all psychotic. From working with psychosis to the theory of thinking. Freud famously thought psychotics were unanalyzable. Bayan was one of a small group of analysts who fortified by the exploration of their own primitive mental functioning in their analyses with Klein felt able to work with such patients. Puzzling over why such patients were so hard to understand, Bayan identified what he called attacks on linking, attacks on the awareness of reality in the linking of objects necessary to thinking itself. Such attacks defend psychotics against the unbearable emotional truths in their lives. Working with such disordered forms of thinking, or what the psychotic did instead of thinking, led Bayan into theorizing what the normal person does when they think. As he stated later, it would be easy to say that the obvious thing to do with thoughts is to think them. It is more difficult to decide what such a statement means in fact. In practice, the statement becomes more meaningful when it is possible to contrast what, is, what a psychotic personality does with thoughts instead of thinking them, and how much discipline and difficulty a measure of coherent thinking involves for anyone. Thinking is hard and can be painful. Most of the time, people do not really think. They reproduce ideas that are already circulating without any development of them. What we have found is that Bayan's theory of thinking offers us a way of helping make sense of what some of the obstacles are to such development. In this section, we are asking readers to immerse themselves in <clears throat> rather difficult material <coughs> whose importance and relevance may be hard to ascertain. We find it is worth it. Getting a handle on Bayan's theory of thinking poses certain problems. One difficulty is that it is not really one theory, but a series of models of mental growth and development. And there are questions how each model relates to the others. Another difficulty is that in Bayan's writings, in addition to introducing a series of new concepts, he often chooses to represent them with symbols and algebraic notation. The reader is faced with K and um, minus K for knowing and its opposite beta elements, alpha function, and alpha elements for the most basic mental functions, preconceptions, realizations, and conceptions for steadily more complex forms of proto-thoughts. K-O for shift from knowing to becoming. P-S to D for an oscillation between the paranoid schizoid and depressive positions. Come here. Even the concrete sounding metaphor or of container and contained is sometimes represented by the symbol for, I think, female for container and the symbol for male for contained. I don't fucking fucking algebra, like word algebra, fucking annoying. Bayan's stated purpose in using such symbols was to avoid words already saturated with existing meanings and associations so that readers are forced to themselves are forced to themselves look for realizations of the ideas in their own thinking. The reader is then asked not to passively absorb the theory but to actually think themselves. For our purposes, we will not explain all of Bayan's terms and symbols in any depth, but just touch on ones which have come to have a particular significance for us. And these are K and uh, minus K, container and contained, PS to D, mystic and establishment. And K and minus K again. Oh no, that's a heading. K and minus K. <laughs> Bayan sees that in the individual and the group, there is both a drive towards thinking, learning, and development, which he terms K, and forces that are antithetical to thought and change, which he calls minus K. Bayan distinguishes between possessing bits of knowledge and knowing as the function of a relationship 
The former is a kind of knowing about that lends itself to controlling the object. The latter K involves getting to know an ongoing link between subject and object, and links between one's objects. In the Kleinian and object relations version of psychoanalysis before buy-in, the main relations between self and objects were love and hate. With the notion of the K-link, Bayan elevated the drive to knowledge, K, to a level with love, L, and hate, H, as a fundamental effective emotional link between the subject and its objects. Okay, at this point they're like literally throwing out like mathematical equations, and I don't know how I'm supposed to read these, but... Just as XLY or XHY indicate a relation of love or hate between X and Y, the phrase XKY indicates a relation or process in which X is in a state of getting to know Y and Y is in a state of getting to be known by X. For buy-in attempting to be in a relation of knowing, the K-link or K makes emotional demands. K involves a process of exploration which entails openness and risk. Openness and risk. A process that is never completed and has a transformative effect on the knower as well. It requires tolerance of the pain and frustration of not knowing. In the faith that if one has patience and perseveres, then sense will emerge and transformation or mental growth will occur. However, Bayan was quick to note that there exists an opposite process, the mind actively seeking not to know, minus K, minus K, oh fuck. Minus K is not the same as not knowing. It is a state of avoidance of awareness of not knowing. In minus K, instead of the pain and frustration of not knowing being tolerated, allowing it to be modified towards mental growth, it is evaded. To evade frustration is to evade knowing this, the object. Thus, X minus K, Y indicates that X is in an active, if unconscious way, attempting not to know why. Bayan offers that minus K can express itself in extreme ways, as he found in his psychotic patients, but also in much less obvious ways as something we all engage in. In terms of the earlier theory of groups, we can see the work group as oriented to K and the basic assumption group as expressing minus K. Minus K can take numerous forms, simply rejecting the new experience, asserting that one's existing categories are adequate, substituting an assertion of right and wrong for determining what is actually the case, or jumping to action without reflection. Such forms as these are all means to avoid recognizing the need for new thinking and the benefit of learning from experience. One of the most effective obstacles to knowing is the idea that one already knows. It is possible to use the mind to acquire more and more pieces of knowledge, but at the same time avoid any significant change. This is common in academia, but it is also present in the political sphere in the form of the hack who has read some books. The idea that one knows already that existing categories and schemas make sense of experience can be one of the most effective ways of evading the transformative relation of getting to know. Morality as substitution for K. When there is an attempt to understand a subject, it is possible to short circuit the process by shifting the issue to whether something is good or bad. Morality substitutes for K. One notices such a move where moral attitude gets in the way of understanding occurs fairly regularly in political discussion and controversies. To take two current examples, the white middle class character of Extinction Rebellion and its civil disobedience tactics are not just taken as a feature of the movement, limits to be explored, but as a reason to dismiss it. Or the right wing views of many participants in the Yellow Vests movement is used to deny its proletarian nature. These are things that must be engaged with, engaged with theoretically if one wants to understand and practically if one wants to participate, but morality can be used to obviate the difficulty in properly understanding and engaging a phenomenon. To assert that something is bad is typically to claim to know it and to be separate from its badness. One doesn't have to make the effort to understand its complexity, tensions and contradictions.
it seems fairly clear that much of what gets seen as identity politics and political correctness is bound up with forms of moralism, the establishing of good and bad with good residing here and bad residing there. Without trying to go deeper into the real sources and nature of domination. At the same time, the way some dismiss identity politics without trying to understand the stakes in any particular case of what gets ranged under this term can express an omnis omniscience claiming moral superiority and splitting of its own. Bayan developed the notation XKY and X minus KY in a psychoanalytic context where the object Y that X is attempting to know or avoid knowing is another person. At first glance, the attempt to understand the social world would appear to be a very difficult task and thus not involve the same difficulties. However, in both cases, the object is not something inanimate to be known like a thing. It involves an emotionally charged experience, one in which the subject is totally implicated. Understanding capitalism is about understanding oneself and understanding oneself requires understanding the socio-political world of which one is a part. There are good reasons to avoid knowing this world. With the idea of minus K, the use of thinking against itself, Bayan provides a fresh way of looking at what has often been seen through the idea of a perjurative conception of, ide of ideology. Indeed, we might say that capitalist society is pervaded by minus K in the sense of an, of an attack on the linking between self and other in its fullest sense. In a world dominated by the capitalist mode of production, to properly understand ourselves requires grasping our relation to everyone and everything else. Yet capitalism necessarily produces a sense of ourselves as atomistic individuals, separate from the matrix out of which we emerge. To a significant extent, taking that illusion for granted, minus K is functional to survival with those social relations even if that survival is existentially impoverished and in the long term places the survival of this and other species in question. Not looking at what is going on in this world, not thinking about the unfolding catastrophe is a major form of minus K, and just as with the psychotic's attacks on linking, it defends against an unbearable emotional truth. However, having an understanding of capitalism is no guarantee of an absence of minus K, in the field in which we operate, we have certainly witnessed groups and individuals who seem to be engaged in resisting knowing things which threaten the identity and what they think they know. The challenge, of course, is to recognize such states in ourselves. In the political world, we encounter minus K again and again. At the same time, struggles continue to show their capacity to surprise us. It is a common observation that in a situation of struggle, and of new experience, it is often the politicos with the rigidity of their existing expectations, their saturated preconceptions, who prove much less able to learn from the new experience than the fresher participants in a movement. At the same time, as the struggle recedes, so does the rapid learning many participants showed during the movement. They seem to return to their older ways of thinking, ways that are more appropriate to the return to normality, and it is the politicos who are left with the task of attempting to explicitly assimilate the experience, something they may do well or not. The most important period of struggles have of course been revolutions and revolutionary waves. The importance we have attributed to the German Dutch Council Communist left and the Italian Bordigas left and their influence on the French and Italian ultra lefts of the 1970s has been that they represent some of the keenest attempts to assimilate respectively the experiences of the revolutionary waves at the end of World War I and at the end of the 1960s. The challenge is to relate to such ideas in an open and not dogmatic way, to not turn away of making sense of experience into an overly restrictive framework. Container and Contained The relationship of container and contained is for buying a flexible model or metaphor to describe how thinking occurs both within individuals and between them in groups. Other theories of knowledge tend to assume that thoughts are the product of a prior process of thinking. Bayan argues that rather than conceiving of thoughts as the product of a prior apparatus for thinking, the thinking apparatus is something that is developed to deal with thoughts. <laughs> 
This container is built up gradually, largely from previous thoughts and in relation to other people's thinking, which at first can do the job of containing for us. The container contained model of thinking emerged from Bayan's engagement with the phenomena of projective identification, as theorized by Klein. Drawing on work with his highly disturbed patients, Bayan sensed that they were communicating with him through projective identification. Bayan's leap was thus to see projective identification as sometimes having a healthy function. It was not necessarily just a way of getting rid of, of or evacuating a bad feeling by projecting it into another person. It could also be a form of primitive or embryonic communication. When the infant has an experience of bad feelings, pain of hunger or worse, an inchoate sense that it is dying, it acts in such a way as to make its carer feel the kind of feelings that the infant wants to be rid of. If this goes well, the mother takes on board the feeling, identifies what is wrong, and responds not only physically with, say, milk, but soothingly. At a mental level of mutual recognition shared by her and the infant, she has observed, processed, and given meaning so as to transform the feeling that the infant is unable to deal with into something named and manageable. The infant deals with its fears, a part of itself, in fantasy by projecting them into the container of the mother's breast. Then again, in fantasy, by feeling it has reintrojected them in a modified, more tolerable form. The mother can be seen as a container represented by, I think, the symbol for male, in which another object, the feelings, represented by this other symbol, is placed. The mother is thus, in a real sense, thinking for the infant. Development occurs for buy-in when the container and contained activity occurring between the infant and mother gradually builds up the infant's capacity to tolerate frustration, allowing the child to interject its own um, oh, fuck. container and contained apparatus. The infant gradually develops a capacity to contain more feelings and thoughts. That is, its thinking of thoughts become less dependent on others carrying this out in its head or in its stead. This apparatus for thinking is thus at the same time a containing of emotional experience and a transmuting of it into cognitive activity. For buy-in, thinking is thus an internal apparatus for dealing with emotionally invested thoughts that we gradually build up, becoming capable of containing more experience and thoughts of increasing levels of abstraction, while at first relying on an, on an other's apparatus to contain us. While each person has, in a sense, their own thinking apparatus, an individual's way of thinking is largely assimilated, adopted, and borrowed through engagement with others. We need to maintain relations with the apparatuses of others. We need first the maternal object, then a wider group, in order to grow and develop. That group does not have to be an actual group, but can include the thinking of others, living and dead, that we access in whatever way. Though we develop our own capacity to contain ourselves and our thinking, this is only relative. Ultimately, we constantly rely on others to contain ourselves and our thoughts. This other expands from the mother to the wider circles in which we are involved, including texts we read, discussions we have, and so on. At a certain level, the communist group, in whatever way it exists, whether as, in, as an actual group or as the theory we adopt from reading or engaging with others is an example of um, a container, a container or apparatus for thinking. Being able to think for oneself means that one has incorporated such an apparatus, but even then one constantly engages with groups in the mind. Our thinking is always responding to and anticipating others' utterances. Thinking happens through the linking or inter interpenetration of one element with another to produce a third, and these connections have an emotional aspect. Bayan contended that the more abstract and complex forms of thinking and theorizing involve con involving concepts that we become capable of as adults are built up from and grounded in linking operations carried out by the infant with more primitive kinds of thoughts he labeled preconceptions and conceptions.
In the familiar and basic example, the infant's inborn disposition to seek the breast is seen as a preconception, a state of expectation, which mates with an awareness of its realization, the presence of the breast, to form a conception of the breast. Once established, this conception can then act as a more developed preconception for further realizations of increasing complexity. Alternatively, the preconception meets not with a realization, but with the frustration of this expectation, its non-realization. And if the infant is able to tolerate its frustration, the perception of the no breast can transform into a thought of the breast. Thus, from a process that started with some simple preconceptions around feeding, breathing, and ex excretion, the meeting of preconception with a realization, or negatively, the failure of a preconception to meet a realization, produces conceptions that are then preconceptions for further realizations and conceptions in a hierarchical way that becomes increasingly abstract and generates ultimately the most sophisticated thinking and finally even complex scientific hypotheses and theories. This is what we are doing when we try to make sense of new developments and struggles. Is the new event a realization of an existing preconception? Thus, not challenging us to develop our theory? Or is it something different, a non-realization of existing ideas requiring us to tolerate the frustration of not knowing in hopes that a new thought will arrive? Thinking, even in its most complex, rational and abstract forms, theories, is rooted in experience, which in the first place is not cognitive, but emotional. At each step, the functions of satisfaction and Frustration play their part in furthering the developing apparatus for thinking. Tolerance of frustration, which at the adult level involves tolerance of doubt, tolerance of not knowing, is the emotional connective tissue on which mental growth occurs, and such growth still has the emotional flavor of the original process. From this perspective, communist theory may be conceived of as an apparatus for thinking that has been built up through an ongoing relationship between the experience of capitalism and previous attempts to think about and make sense of it. Marx is a key figure here in taking some of the most sophisticated theories developed within the bourgeois frame, political economy and Hegelian idealism, and by connecting them to the meaning of the proletarian class struggle transforming them into a theoretical container for thinking the real movement towards communism. It was an extraordinary contribution, but key to such theory is the ability to use it to learn from and think about new experience, the ability to be surprised by the class struggle. The acquiring of knowledge of history, theories, critique, etc. can be part of this process of K, but equally, the acquiring of theoretical frameworks and facts can be about the production of an illusion of knowing that helps one avoid learning something new from experience. The idea that I or my group knows or has the answer undermines uncertainty and the questioning attitude from which alone new ideas can come. We can acquire knowledge to avoid learning from experience as ideas can be used to evade the experience or to rationalize why the experience should not impinge on one's existing paradigm. In discussing the relation between Ricardo and the Ricardian school, Marx seemed to anticipate the difference between open K and dogmatic minus K forms of thinking that he himself would inspire. With the master, what is new and significant develops vigorously amid the manure of contradictions out of the contradictory phenomena. The underlying contradictions themselves testify to the richness of the living foundation from which the theory itself developed. It is different with the discipline. His raw material is no longer reality, but the new theoretical form in which the master had sublimated it. It is in part the theoretical disagreement of opponents of the new theory, and in part the often paradoxical relationship of this theory to reality which drive him to seek to refute his opponents and explain away reality. In doing so, he entangles himself in contradictions and with his attempt to solve these, he demonstrates the beginning disintegration of the theory which he dogmatically espouses. This rejection of dogma in favor of being receptive to the living foundation from which theory emerges connects to what we have derived both from the idea of open Marxism and in terms of Bayan's theory of thinking.
the raw material of reality is, of course, capitalist society and the struggles it engenders. Marxism, in the sense of the theoretical approach that Marx with Engels can be seen to have arrived at in the mid-1840s, is unthinkable without the struggles of the proletariat of that time. Marx famously changed his views on the state in relation to the Paris Commune of 1871. Correspondence with Russian revolutionaries led him to immerse himself in trying to understand social conditions in their area, and to question the linearity and determinism of his own earlier conception of capitalist development. The proletariat's mass strikes and creation of Soviets in the early 20th century produced the basis for the currents that theorized and tried to act on these developments, and who formed a nucleus of opposition to World War I. The revolutionary wave that ended that war produced the intertwined revolution and counter-revolution in Russia, and the attempt to make sense of it, and their own experiences by the German, Dutch, and Italian lefts. The revolutionary wave around 68, with its struggles against and beyond work, questioning all forms of identity, produced the idea of revolution as communization. Part of the difficulty in this is that learning from experience, being in a state of getting to know, involves the necessity of changing the apparatus with which one makes sense of the world, that is, changing oneself. And this can be perceived as a threat of catastrophic change to make sense of this. But, uh, to make sense of this, Bayan returned to the central Kleinian notion of the positions. As we have seen with Klein, the depressive position involves a movement of integration from the non-integrated state of the paranoid schizoid position. Bayan posited oscillation between a kind of healthy version of the paranoid schizoid position and the depressive position as an essential condition of thinking new thoughts, an oscillation he symbolized with the expression P.S. with like an arrow that goes both ways. I don't, I don't know what, what, what it's called, but it's an arrow that goes both ways between P.S. and D. Yeah. So, um, that is the heading for what I can imagine is going to be a very frustrating chapter to, or section to read. Bayan argues that the capacity for learning depends throughout life on the ability to tolerate the paranoid schizoid position, the depressive position, and the dynamic and continuing interaction between the two. An interaction he represented as PSROD. As we have seen for Bayan, growth in K, learning from experience, is not a merely cognitive or intellectual matter, but depends on an emotional climate composed of tolerance, of frustration, and uncertainty. While accumulating new pieces of knowledge within one's existing framework is relatively easy, further growth or development, being open to new ideas to make sense of new experiences, which do not fit into existing preconceptions, requires that one allows one's frame, what, what one thinks one knows, to be questioned. This questioning of one's framework is a destruction or destructuring of the existing thoughts and theories of which the thinking apparatus, um, the container, uh, is composed. Growth in the contained requires growth in the container. An alteration in the container. This series of recombinations can be represented by this very complicated algebraic equation with symbols and lots of shit. It's on page 96. I don't know. Growth in the apparatus, whether that of the individual or of the group, requires that it is able to lose rigidity and even some integration. There is a process of breaking up of the integration, the D position previously achieved. It is thus a limited return to a less stable and more fragmented paranoid schizoid position, PS, in the hope that a subsequent restructuring can allow the depressive position to be regained at a higher level. PS arrows D is then a process of integration, disintegration, and reintegration 
There is no finality in this process. There is always an ongoing process of making sense of or giving meaning to experience, being open to further discoveries, and modifying what one thinks one knows through engagement with what Marx called the raw material of reality. Following Ronald Britton, we can represent it like this. And there are yet again two very long, very... I'm not a mathematician... So, page 97. Have a look-see for yourself. The arrows indicate a process of forward development, and the PSN plus 1 is a normal, controlled, or healthy form of the paranoid schizoid position that comes after the depressive position has been achieved. PSN plus 1 represents a state of taking on board new material, new experience, new ideas, that doesn't fit into the state of integration one has previously reached in the hope that a higher state of integration, dn plus one, is possible. I've learned this stuff before without the, like, formulas and stuff. It's really overcomplicating it. It's not necessary, but whatever. But this is not guaranteed. When one enters the state of psn plus one, the dn plus one that one is aiming for is not present. There is only a hope, not an assurance, that coherence and meaning will arrive. One is also relinquishing an achieved position, D, a state with a certain moral and cognitive confidence, for the incoherence and uncertainty of a less stable and more fragmented state. There is something persecuting in this. It involves accepting emotional discomfort and narcissistic loss. The individual or group is threatened with the prospect of a catastrophe. Thus, the response to the PSN plus one state of having to deal with new material may be not to advance to some higher D position, but to retreat or regress to earlier forms of D which are no longer adequate. Instead of a forward, there is a backwards movement, a regression to an earlier and now inadequate state of D. The controlled PS is lost, and one regresses into pathological states of PS and D, with Britain represent, which Britain represents as PS path and D path, and yet another very complex <laughs> math thing um, on page 98. So go check that out if you want to. When an individual or a group encounters ideas or an experience that question their framework, they have to tolerate the dispersal and threatened loss of meaning in the hope that a D N plus one will emerge. A concrete example was the case of the Praxis group. The group had developed a framework together over a period through reading together and engaging in struggles and movements. The battle over the new ideas resulted in a division of the group into those representing an establishment and those inclined to engage with and partially accept the new ideas. This process, including the conflict, was potentially part of a forward development. However, at a certain time, the pain and discomfort of the loss of cohesive functioning became too much. The PSN plus one became a PS path state where action instead of thinking was used to deal with the problem by getting rid of the disruptive elements. The D state that was returned to can be seen as D path because it was not a new achievement involving loss of the old, but a retreat to an earlier position which was now a defensive organization, excluding rather than incorporating the new material that was being grappled with, with in PSN plus one. The frustration had been evaded right, rather than tolerated. Holding on to a state of integration and meaning that may be coherent but is no longer adequate is a feature of most political groups. Most of what presents itself as revolutionary or communist theory has been held on to past its time. In the model, we have been describing the sense of controlled PS moving towards the achievement of a new D involves a kind of wait and see attitude. Oh, I think, yeah, whatever. Bayan adopts Keats's notion of negative capability to describe the necessary posture. It means being open to new experiences and new ideas, accepting that one doesn't know and that opposing views might be correct. PSN plus one involves refraining from decision until one is able, 
perhaps through, through the emergence of a selected fact, to bring together and make order out of the chaos in, an, in a new whole. A difference between the post-depressive position, PSN plus one, and the original infantile PS or the regressed PS path is that in PSN plus one, one has one as much as possible does not engage in splitting. This is appropriate for the analyst who is calm and almost disinterested in his drive to understand but not to judge or even change the patient. Hoggett, drawing on Meltzer, suggests that there is a different and still healthy way that the paranoid schizoid mechanisms, including splitting, must be mobilized. When engaged in struggle, reality is not a given which must be understood dispassionately, but a process of becoming which must be engaged with. Acting on and in the world is sustained by a passion, anger, grief, hope, which is, as he notes, based on a certain degree of splitting. We cannot just be in doubt and, and, and uncertainty, which implies the movement towards the maturity of the depressive position, for at times we must risk acting, at which point we abandon the openness to a new depressive position and commit ourselves to one course of action that excludes others. As Donald Meltzer suggests, at times the irritable reaching after the fact and reason that Keats abjures is in fact required because splitting processes are necessary for the kind of decisions that make action in the outside world possible. Every decision involves the setting in motion of a single plan from among its alternatives. It is experimental, involves risk, a certain ruthlessness towards oneself and others. This is another way of thinking about PS and D. Those involved in politics, even radical anti-politics, have a propensity for the splitting into good and bad, friend and enemy, of the paranoid schizoid position. Much of the unpleasant group stuff, the understanding of which in part motivates this text, reflects the proneness to the paranoid schizoid position within this space. The observation of this can be part of pathologi pathologizing the political, but while it can certainly be pathological, the paranoid schizoid mode may also perform a, nece a necessary and valuable role in the development of both individuals and groups. Hoggett points to a creative and experimental use of the paranoid schizoid position, which can figure as more than a mere stage before a new depressive position takes hold. He points to the fact that a decision to act involves a suspension of doubt and openness towards other courses of action and perspectives. Indeed, while a claim, while claimed need for action is often used against thinking, it is also possible when one needs to act to instead retreat into thought. In action, there is a risk, potential costs to oneself and others, and thus, as Metzler suggests, certain ruthlessness towards both is required. The uncertainty and tolerance of doubt in one's position is no longer functional. In periods of struggle, this kind of creative use of the paranoid schizoid position, this kind of certainty and commitment to one point of view is necessary. But it needs to be tempered by moments of reflection and openness, and a possibility of reviewing one's course of action in relation to its results, or lack thereof. When the dust clears, the point is to be ruthless with oneself about what the success or failure of any initiative one took could tell us about the nature of the struggle in which one was involved and the stance one has taken in relation to it. This is to move from a necessary period of active PS back into control, into controlled PS and D. Mystic and establishment. One of the key concepts that we found in Hoggett, which seemed to illuminate our two cases, was the idea of the establishment within the group. In the Praxis group, in the Praxis group, we described a conflict between an established ortho orthodoxy within the group <coughs> and new ideas. In the theory group, we described a group functioning creatively without much of an establishment, but that this was unstable leading to crises which eventually necessitated the creation of a, of a sort of establishment. This use of the term establishment derives from Bayan. In a book published in 1970, he notes the way that the term establishment has become used to describe that body of persons within the state who exercise power and responsibility and adopts the term to denote everything from the penumbra of associations generally evoked vote 
to the predominating and ruling characteristics of an individual and the characteristics of a ruling caste, caste in a group, such as a psychoanalytic, such as a psychoanalytical institute or a nation or group of nations. Bayan pairs this notion with another concept, that of the mystic, a figure he says could interchangeably be termed the genius or even messiah. There is, Bayan writes, an emotional pattern that repeats itself in history and in a variety of forms of an explosive force within a restraining framework. For example, the mystic in conflict with the establishment, the new idea constrained within a formulation not intended to express it, the art form outmoded by new forces requiring representation. This pattern, like that of container and contained, which it is an example of, is a somewhat abstract one that can unsurprisingly be seen in all sorts of places. Bayan was prompted to think about the mystic establishment pattern by his experience of the institutionalization process of psychoanalysis. It seems useful to think about it in relation to the communist group. The establishment describes a conservative structure in the group or the individual mind composed of the containing forces or the containing force of old ideas. By mystic, Bayan has in mind the creative disruptive force of new ideas and those who express them. The ideas in question could be scientific, artistic, religious, political, psychoanalytic, whatever represents a profound break from existing dominant ideas and paradigms and opens a new way of thinking in any field. For Bayan, the mystic genius can take the form of a specific individual or individuals, but it can also be seen as something less personal, the flash of genius, the moment of creative insight that any individual should be ready to produce at some time. Bayan includes in the mystic genius category such figures as Galileo, Newton, Freud, Shakespeare, and Marx, but also actual mystics, Jesus, Meister Eckhart, um, Isaac Luria, the common pattern is the way new ideas and those who represent them challenge the established conventions of the group in which they emerge. New ideas are perceived as disruptive and even destructive of the group. They can be perceived to threaten a catastrophe, but they are also necessary if the group is to develop. Bayan thinks it is a proper function of the establishment to create an environment in which genius, whether it be the particularly gifted individual or the flash of genius, that any of us can have from time to time is able to emerge. However, this function comes into tension with the establishment's other purpose, which is to find and provide a substitute for genius. Because mystics or mystic flashes are in short supply, the establishment makes up for their absence by promulgating rules, dogmas, and scientific laws that allow knowledge to be had and to be conveyed without group members having to create it themselves. In creating and enforcing such rules, the establishment allows group members a sense of participation in an experience from which they would otherwise feel forever excluded. However, as Bayan notes, the problem is that these rules or dogmas must at the same time maintain a continued supply of genius. This cannot be ordered, but if it comes, the establishment must be able to stand the shock. Failing genius and clearly it may not materialize for a very long period, the group must have its rules and a structure to preserve them. Bayan suggests that relations between the mystic and the group can take three forms, parasitic, commensal, or symbiotic. The difficult relation of the three actual mystics Bayan has mentioned to the religious establishments shows these, these three forms in a clear light. In the parasitic relation, the relation is destructive. The creative new ideas are either crushed by the rigidity of the container or the container is blown apart by the power of the new ideas. Jesus crucified by the establishment. In the commensal relation, the old and new ideas manage to exist alongside each other, but without really affecting growth in either. The Christian establishment tolerates mystics like Eckhart without the church being changed by them. In the third relation, the symbiotic, Bayan writes that there is a confrontation and the result is growth producing, though that growth may not be discerned without difficulty, the Hasidic movement in relation to rabbinical Judaism.
He suggests that, as well as within the group, these shapes exist within the individual and can also be played out in the encounter between different individuals and groups. Just as a group may reject a new idea and the person who expresses it as something they are unable to contain, an individual may reject a new idea as something he or she is not able to bear. As with the development of thinking in general, we are dealing with something that can be intra-individual, inter-individual, intra-group, and intergroup. Though it may be tempting, it would make little sense in relation to the communist groups, or even groups more generally, to simply take the side of the mystic genius. The establishment's resistance to mystics and their dangerous ideas is necessary. One reason is that most new ideas are not better than the old, and some are destructive, which Bayan evokes in the figure of the nihilist mystic, even when there is something important in the new ideas. They need to be tested. It is the creative tension between new ideas and the old, the mystic and the establishment, that may produce something worthwhile. While if the new impulse meets no resistance, it may dissipate itself in a formless splurge. Bayan's term genius may meet with skepticism in communist circles, as it appears to be a rather bourgeois individualist notion. However, the apparent tension between Bayan's concern for the fate of the individual thinker and a Marxian idea that ideas are produced by the class struggle is perhaps not so insurmountable. An important part of Bayan's understanding is that creative individuals do not produce their challenging ideas from their own minds, but instead create links that make sense of experience, giving expression to new ideas that have a social or trans-individual -individu source. Moreover, Bayan's seemingly individualist concept of genius or mystic needs to be placed in the context of his profoundly non-individualist notion that true thoughts are not the product of the individual thinker, but that instead the individual gains his significance by being able to entertain them. The genius for Bayan is not someone who invents things from his own brain, but one who opens up to the ideas that are there to be expressed. Yet breakthroughs to a revolutionary new way of approaching reality, opening a new field or problematic, are often linked to an individual. Bayan's reflections on these questions are prompted by Freud and the psychoanalytic establishments created on the basis of his work. Marx would seem to be clearly, in Bayan's terms, another such genius, mystic, upon whose legacy a new establishment or establishments have been produced. Interestingly, however, one of the few recorded remarks that Bayan made on Marxism was that, at least as a theory, it had approximately achieved, along with Sufism, doing without an establishment. The idea of Marxism doing without an establishment might seem odd. Hasn't Marxism often been compared with religion in a negative sense? Wasn't Kotsky referred to as the Pope of Marxism? Didn't the parties of the Second, Third, and Fourth Internationals operate by way of an established orthodoxy with the same conformist modes of thinking and exclusion of heresies? Hasn't doctrinal dispute often been settled by appeal to quotes from infallible scriptural authority? Marxism certainly seems to have had its own establishments, both in the sense of institutional authorities like parties and even states, but also in the less obvious sense of the rigidities of thought that even those who see themselves as independent Marxists often fall foul of. Yet, as we suggested in part two, Bayan's suggestion that the theory of Marxism has approximately achieved the avoidance of the establishment also captures something. The critical impulse of the communist theory expressed by Marx, a thinking open to the raw material of reality, has never been entirely contained and stripped of meaning by the various worldviews, parties, schools, traditions, and orthodoxies that have been established in his name. Within, outside, and against these currents, there have always been critical, heterodox forms of thinking that have clashed with the conformist use of Marx. Of Marx. Indeed, communist theory has not been without its own supply of new genius. Though the critical impulse of thinkers like Luxembourg, Panacoke, Bordiga, Korch, uh, Lucas, Pashukanis, Rubin, Bloch, Adorno, Debord, and Kmat, and the fresh take on reality they provide, has often in turn been a basis for new establishments. Such thinkers are a product of their times, notably the two revolutionary waves that characterized the 20th century, and often they themselves fall back 
from their more interesting and revolutionary positions in the period of retreat. To place Amadeo Bordiga in this line of mystics geniuses might seem odd. After all, Bordiga himself insisted that he had not created anything new. He rejected the banal idea that Marxism is a theory. Undergoing a process of continuous historical elaboration that changes with the changing course of events and the lessons subsequently learned, and instead asserted what he called the invariance of Marxism. In the period after the defeat of the, of the post-World War I revolutionary wave and the failure of World War II to end in a similar wave, Bordiga saw his task and that of the group who gathered round him as essentially one of defending the, this doctrine until better times. While we have emphasized the need to be willing to change one's framework, Bordiga railed against those who would change the Marxist framework too easily. Writing in the 50s, he divided the opponents of the Marxist doctrine into three broad groups, the deniers, the, bourgeois, or the bourgeoisie for whom the marketing commodity production are eternal, the falsifiers, the Stalinists, and others who claim to be Marxists but practice a social democratic reformism, and the modernizers, those who still claim to be revolutionary but think the doctrine needs to be modified. He reserved some of his heaviest critique for the latter group with Cardin, Kistoriadis, of socialism or barbarism being a frequent target. Thus, just as he rejected those who would moderate Marxism by emphasizing peaceful and democratic methods, he scorned those who claimed to still be revolutionary but saw a need to modernize the conception of capitalism by defining it, or at least its Eastern Bloc variant in terms of bureaucracy. Bordiga would thus appear to reject our emphasis on doubt, receptivity to the new, negative capability, and theory as open or good conversation. Bordiga indeed seems not so much a mystic as the promoter of an establishment, a rigid doctrine. What figures like Luxembourg, Panacoke, or Debaud see as the creative discoveries of class struggle, the Paris Commune, the Soviets, modern forms of revolt, etc., are for Bordiga ways in which a renewal of the class struggle allows the theory to return with affirmations reminiscent of its origins and its integral expression. But we know that claiming to fulfill the law and not abolish it is a venerable role for the mystic. In Bordiga's writings, along with statements of rigid tactical doctrine that seem on the surface not so different from other versions of Leninism, we find an extraordinary communist vision, including the rejection of self-management and a prescient grasp of capitalism as an ecological crisis. Bordiga's thought expressed the high points of the post-World War I revolutionary wave and held it when most other Marxists capitulated one way or the other. He knew the difference between capitalism and communism, something that, with few exceptions, isn't understood by social democrats. Marxist, Leninists, Trotskyists, democratic and libertarian socialists. Bordiga and his group kept something communist alive in a period of the defeat of the revolution, and they did so through a certain doctrinal rigidity. This rigidity served a protective function. However, while Bordiga himself was able to develop theory within this shell, most of his followers were not. Their rigidity meant that they were largely unable to connect to the new revolutionary wave that rose in the 1960s. It was through the work of the quintessential communist mystic Jacques Kemet that the insights of Bordiga spread to the new movements, which arose especially in France and in Italy. And in Italy. Yet by that time, Kamat had been marked as a heretic among Bordigists. Kamat's relationship to the Italian left has similarities with Bayan's relationship to Kleinian psychoanalysis. The latter has been known like Bordiga's Marxism for a certain rigidity of, or dogmatism. However, it was through and with this rigid Kleinian apparatus, which he made his own, that Bayan developed his creative breakthroughs. Similarly, it was through absorbing the intransigent Marxism of Bordiga that Kmet made his own leaps. The relationship between Bayan and the Kleinian group was at least for a number of years, probably a symbiotic one, but he found it necessary to escape the group in which he had at first been able to develop. Beyond the constraints of the groups that had produced them, both Kmet and Bayan were able to produce more freely 
with some wondering if their production became a bit too free. Despite Bayan's intriguing idea that communist theory, like Sufism, can approximately do without an establishment, we can see in these examples that groups and individuals who are always part of groups, if only the many groups we connect with in our minds, necessarily produce establishments as part of the limits and containment of their thinking. Often such a container is adequate to get on with things. The point is, without seeking out novelty for itself, to be open to the expression of new things, which requires breaking or modifying such limits of our thinking. An ending, not a conclusion. By its nature, this is a work in progress, as there must be, for now, an ending, if not a conclusion, let us attempt to tie our threads together. Our starting point was that communism is and will be the intense and unpredict unpredictable struggle for life on the part of the species. If the communist group at one level is all those, millions, even billions, who have been, are, or will be involved in that struggle, then that also includes us, right here, right now, feeling moved to be part of this struggle and to do what we can. This involves us connecting with small numbers of others to think about capitalism and its possible overcoming. We are admittedly a bit unusual, deviations, as Moss put it. For accidents of our personal history, we have, like Marx, found that the ideas of communism, which have conquered our intellect and taken possession of our minds, ideas to which reason has fettered our conscience, are chains from which one cannot free oneself without a broken heart. They are demons which human beings can vanquish only by submitting to them. These ideas are not personal possessions, but something impersonal, transmitted through the generations. Communist theory is an apparatus for thinking the experience of life dominated by capital and the movement beyond it. Some take up this apparatus, making it theirs for as long as they are able. They may in the process succeed in adding some new true thoughts, which increase the capacity which increase the capacity of the apparatus in relation to the evolving experience that it attempts to contain. <clears throat> At its best, this process is international and self-correcting. We have suggested Gunn's model of the good conversation for the way that it develops. In Gunn and Wilding's more recent work, we also identified a tantalizing suggestion of what might link the conversations of the willed small groups we participate in and those that occur in the spontaneous group processes of revolution. At a certain level, the communist group, in whatever way it exists, whether as an actual group or as the theory we adopt from reading or engaging with others, is an example of a container or apparatus for thinking. We always need others to talk to. At the same time, with our case studies of small group life, we pointed at some of the problems that arise in this small world we inhabit. We expect that others have their own stories. Such tales reveal that attempts at good conversation often meet obstacles and tensions within the group. Dealing with such tensions can make severe emotional demands, while coming together with others is necessary and rewarding. The groups that we form often seem to involve swapping the pathological solitude of the ego for the pathologies of small group life. This is understandable because the group or collective in capitalist society is no less a part and product of capitalist society than the individuals of which it is composed. Reflection here can benefit from drawing on the theory of the unconscious, which can be understood not as something personal and individual, but as a social and transpersonal phenomenon. Groups bring out the unconscious and make it visible. A psychoanalytic take on groups and on thinking offered by buy-in and others helps make sense of this process. The recurrent tension is between the universal universality of what we want and the particularity and limits of who we are as individuals and small groups. The stakes seem so different, but at some level, we sense that they are the same. The healthy impulse is to focus not on who we are as a group, but simply on the tasks we set ourselves. However, the pathologies of communist groups can at times be more interesting than what such groups produce, because it tells us something about capitalist life itself. We do not produce struggle or revolution. We are produced by it. This is why the periods of the most creative leaps in thinking have occurred at the same time of revolutionary moments and waves. What Marx calls the party of anarchy makes its reappearance from time to time. 
though those who produced end notes did not actively participate in the struggles of those years listed above, which was um, 1848, 1871, 1917, 1917, oh fuck, 1917 to 21, 1968 to 71, um, did not actively participate in the struggles of those years listed above. We and the world we live in were shaped by them their measure of success and their defeat. These events and cycles of struggle have tended to be followed by much longer periods of more stable, of more stable capitalist development and more limited struggles. The capitalism we face today learnt the lessons of those struggles and restructured itself accordingly. Thus, we do not need to pass on the working class lessons from those years for the relation with capital they live today contains all the lessons of history that they need. We, however, find something useful in looking back. A large part of the communist theory we have inherited was a product of the encounter of a container, councilist, situationist, and bordigist thought, with the contained, the new experience of the struggles of the last revolutionary wave and their defeat. Such theory was tested, and while some concluded that reality was guilty of not measuring up, the working class did not produce councils or join their party. Others were able to transform the theory to better express what this wave and its defeat was telling us. The burst of theoretical development had largely concluded by the end of the 70s. However, just as with the small groups of Bordigists and council communists after the previous revolutionary wave, some of those who were turned communist by the revolutionary period did not go over to the counter-revolution, but rather theorized it and the restructuring that accompanied it. We have been drawn to this theory and we attempt to contribute to it. Our lives, too, have not been without their moments and cycles of struggle, such as the anti-globalization movement at the turn of this century, the movement of the squares in 2011 to 2013, and what may be a new global wave unfolding at the time of writing. The instability of our times assures us that there will be plenty more. We can imagine that some readers of EndNotes may at times have asked themselves, well, that's all well and good, but what do you propose we actually do? The perceived alternative seems to be of revolutionary intervention or attentism. There's either a revolutionary communist way of relating to struggles or one should not be involved at all. Um, Teddy communist, provide us with a helpful way of cutting through all this false alternative. In the meantime, neither orphans of the labor movement nor prophets of the communism to come, we participate in the class struggle as it is on a daily basis and as it produces theory. This idea that it is not we, but the class struggle that produces theory reminds one of buy-in. Of course, this leaves a lot open. For example, what class struggle is participated in and how is the theory being produced by the class struggle recognized? There's no revolutionary way of engaging in struggles unless, of course, those struggles are revolutionary. This does not mean one should not be involved in non-revolutionary struggles. However, one can only relate to struggles according to their limits. Being involved may help you to find those limits allowing one to make sense of them in ways that non-participants cannot. <coughs> However, involvement may also lead one to deny those limits and to be only interested in ideas that support one's own illusions. Illusions or myths are a necessary part of group life, allowing a creative escape from the given into the realm of the possible, of the not yet, but at times disillusionment is also necessary for moving forward. Openness is not just about being open to the ideas of self-identified communists and revolutionaries. We wish to be open to moments of genius, wherever they may be found, in all forms of scientific thinking, in a broad and not reductive sense as a search for truth. Marx's motto was, nothing human is alien to me, and it would be absurd for communists to limit their interests and concerns as if they were workers specialized in a particular art instead of aiming at devoting themselves to the whole universe. Communist theory has a universal significance. It expresses a will to life on the part of humanity against capital, a force it has created and continues to create which threatens its destruction. At the same time, those trying consciously to think it 
or just individuals in small groups doing what we can. A guiding thought for those engaged in such a task. The group must be capable of maintaining the dominance of its own depressive attitude. This means, despite its sense of vision and grandiosity, retaining the capacity to keep a sense of perspective, and hence, knowing that what may be created will not be perfect, but, but could be good enough.